wow, that got, it got so quiet in here. <laughs> so now, now I feel like we should start. Holy smokes. Um, yeah, strange times we are in. Um, uh, and, and speaking of those, I just think we would be remiss. I, the, the president today in Buffalo was saying that you know, hate, hate won't win, and it doesn't always feel that way. Um, it, and in fact, it often doesn't feel that way. And um, I just thought we would just take a moment to start. I think that is appropriate to just pause for a minute to think about the, the victims in, 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 that, uh, in that city that's our neighbor. Um, I, I, I've, I've often been a, a fan of that, it's cliche now, I suppose, but that Gramsci quote about pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. Um, and it's the times where I have felt optimistic is in community. Uh, and so being with you all here is something that is making me feel more optimistic. Um, I do think uh, that that's, something that we think about things we've lost in, in the pandemic, the, the uh, certainly million people is a, a tragedy, but the, something we don't often talk about are the ideas that were lost, that were, we were denied by being able to come together and talk to each other. I just firmly believe you don't know what you think until you say it or write it. And often saying it is one of the best ways because people can respond to you in real time and you can refine that idea. And so uh, I am hoping, we do not know is around the corner, but that we are going to have uh, more opportunities like this to talk to each other. And um, thanks to that booster requirement, I think we've got about 300 people who are not going to be here today that thought they were. So uh, we're going to have lots of time to have a more intimate discussion than I thought we were going to have, that this was going to be a much bigger audience uh, on paper. Um, so uh, I really do want to encourage you to sort of think of some questions, we're going to have time for that in the uh, and that after uh, Clara gives her remarks um, and the panel begins. But uh, also, we have a reception that I really encourage you to stay uh, and join us uh, at that time, so we can have these conversations and 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 really keep keep the conversation moving. Um, I know a lot of you in the audience, and uh, and it's a pretty large sample size, so I think statistically speaking, I can then generalize the entire group. You are brilliant. This is a very, very smart group. And, uh, but I will tell you one thing that I also know, which is that uh, we are smarter together than we are individually. And um, you know, when you look at the, sort of the history of science, where were the breakthroughs, it often was a society of friends, it was a group, it was a club, it was an atmosphere that allowed a group of people to come together and have conversations and really think these things through. Um, and uh, as somebody who has spent all of my life practically uh, living in California, I've been in New York for a couple of years, people often ask me what's the difference, how do you feel between San Francisco and New York? And you know, I, I um, I, you know, everybody, any, everybody around the country knows New York on some level, um, but uh, the thing that I did not know, uh, and this is something I think about, like, uh, with my friend Laurel Callanan in the audience, we think about artists and art institutions as being sort of a, a, a channel, a, you know, artists being, a, uh, being able to channel investments into low-income communities. In California, in San Francisco, I could easily get 100 people to come together and have that conversation. In New York, you can get 1,000 people to come together on that. On any topic, there are so many problem solvers here. There are so many people who are, uh, who are, um, have read the books that you read, to know the things that you know. And so I am just hoping we can just keep, keep this ball rolling, keep this community coming together. This is that society, this is that club that I think is trying to wrestle through some of the answers on how we can make a better world. One of the ways we do that, I think, is by the supply and demand of capital, and that's what this discussion is going to be today. Um, so I'm really thrilled that you're all here to sort of sh to share your ideas, to talk with us, to uh, think with us, and uh, hopefully act with us so we can do uh, better by the people we're trying to serve. A um, few housekeeping issues. Um, I get in a lot of trouble if you come in here with a drink or food, so please don't do that. It's brand new, this auditorium is brand new, look at the size of this television. 
that's you know I don't even know where you make, where you get that, but uh, but. Um, so, so please, no food and drink in the, in the auditorium. The bathrooms are just back here. There are some bathrooms actually on the 13th floor as well. So if you were going out the back, you can find some up there as well. Um, there's a coat check around the corner here. Um, and we will be ending at, uh, let's see, 5.30, and that's when the reception will begin. Um, about that time, the front door is closed. So you'll have to exit on the A level. So when you go into the elevator, just hit A, not one, okay? Um, okay, now I'm excited to introduce an old friend, Clara Miller. Um, so Clara has um, got her start in community development by sort of making this observation that uh, these nonprofits were operating these very expensive and inefficient uh, boilers, and she thought, "This is crazy. You're it's you're." You're losing money. You're you're uh, polluting the building that you're working in, and we could we could pay for these with the savings if we were able to get ahead of it and finance them properly. And no one had really quite figured that out until Clara came along and started the nonprofit finance fund. So there was just this, you know, uh, great idea and the optimism of the will, and she made it happen, and she created. Uh, the nonprofit finance fund, one of the bedrocks of community development finance uh, to this day, and has been a leader in the field for 30 years. Um, but then went on to work in, in uh, the foundation world where uh, Claire was absolutely a leader again uh, in that community, but really pushing that community to think differently about how they deployed their assets. Sort of one of her hallmarks, of course, was pushing foundations to think about why are you spending 95% of your uh, corpus investing willy-nilly when you, to create the 5% that you grant for the things that you care about? Why tie both your hands behind your back when you could put 100% towards mission, right? And so Clara was, uh, I think, the first foundation to do that and the only foundation that I know of that has been able to put 100% of their corpus towards uh, the mission that they're trying to serve. Um, she's weirdly smart about like uh, uh, finance and, uh, and, and funny arcane aspects of accounting, you know, <laughs> which is unusual for an art major from, you know, that she says, and that's her usual line. She's like, guys, it's not that hard. I'm, a, I'm an art major. You can figure this out, right? And uh, so she's just got these amazing insights from that long career in community development finance, in, uh, in her work with the foundation world, and inspired by her art. Her, her screen debut was as the Nightingale of Samarkand on the uh, Dartmouth uh, uh, Hopkins Center in, um, I, I, won't give the, I won't give the year, but uh, <laughs> long, a long history of combining sort of practical thinking and with an artistic soul, and so we're very excited to have Claire with us today. So Claire, come on up and, and give us your talk. David, that is the first time that it has been divulged that I was the nightingale of Samarkand at the, you know, I won't, I won't say the, the year either, but also in that production, which was at Dartmouth College, um, I was a townie. Um, there was uh, Jerry Zachs, who later became a big Broadway director, and Bob Reich, who later became Secretary of Labor. Anyway, he played the mute king, which was not, uh, to, you know, it was not typecasting for Bob Wright, for any of you who know him. <laughs> anyway, money and mission. I, I'm, of course, you know, <laughs> sounds great. I mean, who could object, right? This sounds wonderful. Um, we're making progress, but it's still largely aspirational and kind of episodic and it's about people yodeling, you know, kind of commitments of money and policy ideas and so on and so forth. Um, and so I am going to talk today about the thing that's really going to make the difference. Um, and that's if we stop yodeling from the mountaintops and fix the plumbing, then the capital will flow. So with that image in your mind, <laughs> I want you to go back to um, 1889 um, and to a different world 
in which the crucible of philanthropy had its start. And it was, of course, Pittsburgh, I mean, you could say. This was a world where geographic pull of place made a lot of difference. There was the confluence of water transportation, iron ore and coal coming in from the Midwest, rail infrastructure, voila, the steel industry, markets were geographically bounded, uh, banks and businesses were focused geographically, owners lived near their workers, you know, things seemed predictable, Th things seemed, you know, and enlightened self-interest was something folks could maybe depend on. Uh, social cohesion, a seemingly inexhaustible natural resource supply. It seemed like the social compact was firm. I, however, I just want to say, to avoid having rose-colored glasses about this, there was much less education. There were no black or female voters at the time, relatively little in the way of rights for any subjugated being at all. Unions were in infancy. Monopolistic business practices, savage and racist labor practices, and corrupt governments just to start a very, very long list. So it wasn't perfect, but it was imageable, <laughs> right? And that's where institutional <laughs> philanthropy was cradled in this predictable world. And Andrew Carnegie in 1889 wrote this thing called the Gospel of Wealth, and it kind of established the idea. Uh, it was in a target-rich environment, obviously. Nobody was doing much of any kind of institutional philanthropy. And his formula and his style was linear and successive. His idea was a third, a third, a third. First third of your life, you'll learn stuff. Second third of your life, you make a lot of money. Third third of your life, you give it away to good things that are good for the public. And, oh, by the way, a man who dies wealthy dies disgraced. So he was very clear about that. And he actually thought that, you, you know, capitalism was a huge positive, that anybody, a worker who got a job in a capitalist enterprise was lucky. And that, in fact, it was, it was a le even though it was rapacious and damaging, it was a lesser evil than not having the benefits of capitalism. In fact, he had a kind of an allergy to charity, which was odd. This is a quote. Those who don't require assistance are more worthy. That was his hallmark. So to him, philanthropy was about solving these sort of generalized problems uh, after the fact that would be bounded, comprehensible, actionable, you know, more educated, healthy workers. What's not to like about that? that these two things work together. And the shared understanding in this world is that the general good is somehow separate from the market. That the market happens over here and it's all fine and just don't look at the sausage being made. And then after you've succeeded at business, then you kind of go back and clean up the icky parts. Today we're not in 1889. It, I mean, I'm not sort of standing here holding a brief for this as a way to do philanthropy but orderly, transactional, neatly divided world and economy is no longer, have long vanished. Markets are global, owners are no longer living near their workers. Factory workers don't face the workers in their factories in India when they go for coffee in Santa Barbara. That world has disappeared. You know, shame, guilt, and stuff like that, which are really the, the main motivating factors behind a lot of philanthropy eh, don't exist the way they did in Pittsburgh in 1889. Our dominant business models routinely shed human labor. They cut out intermediaries, retail shops, com consume community scale businesses, and wealth inequality has become sort of a long time trend here in the States. Contingent and part-time employment's the rule. I know everybody in this room knows this stuff. And governments are forced today in a way that it wasn't, even given entitlements, private for-profit enterprise is as likely to be funded by government in the form of subsidy and as, a, as, a, as a, an insurance and as a customer um, as to be regulated by them. And it's sort of a balance of the two. And most worrying, a new set of issues has intruded, climate change, 
the rise of violent authoritarianism, degradation of biological systems, global epidemics, and these all affect global markets and local markets. So our image of the need, these aren't about the fringes of society anymore, they're about society itself. And our image of the neat segmented market where Wall Street did its thing and Main Street did its thing and government did its thing and they coexisted and they traded stories, but they all had discrete, well understood roles. That's disappeared. That's gone. We don't have in, those institutions are no longer built for purpose because we're still back in 1889 with our cherished assumption. The way I call that our plumbing those old ways of doing business. Um, well, hang on, what are some examples of plumbing? So, you know, exhibit A for me, you know, you've heard me bang on about this enough. Foundation business model. When I tell them 100, you know, Heron is great. 100% of our assets are aligned with our mission. They say, well, what were you doing before? <laughs> Isn't that what foundations do, for heaven's sakes? And the funding and financing rules for social sector organizations, I you know, tried to think of a math problem that fit it. Deficit rationing, which is the way revenue goes in, plus growth equals starvation. That is the system for funding social sector organizations. And the idea that fiduciary duty only pertains to the narrow task of preserving a small pot of money or even a huge pot of moment money, not both that and standing for the broad interests of the beneficiaries. I don't think that's fiduciary responsibility anymore, maybe once in a blue moon somewhere. So anyway, even with, you know, you, you may say, wait a minute, institutions are changing. We've rebranded ph philanthropy and foundations and we're developing inspiring rhetoric about trust and power sharing and so on. And you know, we've got these trust initiatives. Well, that's fine. You know, that's not bad, but it's not enough. We're still being guided by the internal customs and rules and regulations. No matter what we do on the outside, no matter how many yodels from the mountaintop about policy, there it's the same. Um, when in doubt, we in philanthropy, and I count myself among philanthropoids, like to quote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He famously said, and, and there are so many quotes, philanthropy must not cause the philanthropist to overlook the circumstances of economic injustice that make philanthropy necessary. And after we, inevitably, we all engage in vigorous head nodding when that quote emerges, yes. And then we say it's about system change, yes. And we completely love system change, of course, all of us, right? That's what we have to do. But we generally love it most when it's about somebody else's system, <laughs> not ours. Wait a minute, we're trying to do good here. How, how dare you question our trust building initiative? As my mother used to say, some things are more fun to think about than to do. <laughs> I would say system change falls into that category. But we won't change any systems without doing some unglamorous work on our own house. And our own house, and uh, you know what I'm talking about, the unglamorous work in our own house is the plumbing. Okay, so let's, I'm gonna tell you three quick stories, I hope they're quick, um, that illustrate bits of what that invisible plumbing looks like. Am I out of time already? No, okay. <laughs> the first one is of course about J.P. Morgan. I mean the bank. And I don't mean J.P. Morgan Chase, which was the bank about after many, many, many mergers, acquisitions, and so on in the banking industry. And we have some veterans of that, and I won't, I won't point them out in this room, but anyway. So J.P. Morgan discovered to its chagrin and panic in 1980 that it had somehow, the, the, it was a wholesale investment bank, and it became subject to the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, and this was, this was worrying, really. And so it decided to try to fulfill its obligations, which I think was a very appropriate thing to do. And when they calmed down 
after doing a variety of funny things, they appointed a banker, an investment banker in their mid, Morgan banker, of course, by the name of Oliver Wesson, Jr., who became the first president of their community development corporation. Uh, we nonprofit denizens were quite skeptical, but I was raising money, so anybody's okay. And I wanted Morgan to participate in a loan to the nonprofit finance fund, which I was say I headed at the time. He invited me to a lunch in Morgan's private dining room. You know, gliding waiters, linen napkins, a hushed atmosphere, men in suits. And I, uh, I arrived um, after a very sweaty subway ride uh, from Midtown to Wall Street. Um, and during which I was thinking about my ask, and of course I expected to have to promise, as I did routinely for other banks, to put their name on a banner at a public event, have the public event, which we really didn't do, then to have someone from their PR department speak at the event, and to have, of course, three ring notebooks with their branding on them prominently displayed on a table somewhere. This was standard operating procedure, and I didn't like it. It had nothing to do with what we did, but nonetheless, I was ready to give in to Oliver's demands for a three-ring notebook. So I arrived, and we chatted for a while, and then I was summoning my courage for the ask when he looked across the table at me and he said, how do we help you meet your growth needs? I was speechless. I didn't even know how to think about answering that question. Nobody, no funder, nobody had ever asked me that question before. It was complete cognitive dissonance. But that was just an investment banker talking to a customer. It happened to be a really nice guy who thought that that was his job. How do we help you meet your growth, growth needs or even how do you, we help you meet your needs so you'll become a robust enterprise and can do your important work? It would be revolutionary if that were the main question grant makers asked grantees, foundations asked the people they're asking to do their wonderful work. But that's just what investment bankers do. He was treating me as a customer. It would be an easy change, wouldn't it? in the plumbing of grant making. Which brings me to our risk story. And this is really about another part of our economic system, the endowment, but also way down in the market infrastructure in general. Asset managers, corporations, institutions, banks, all fiduciaries must manage risk. And one of my four fellow board members of the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, and now I'm, going to, I'm not going to go into accounting, I promise. Um, SASB was a, was a firm that developed reporting uh, standards for public company disclosure of risks beyond financial only that include material risks to them of environmental, social, and governance topics. Now, my friend on this board headed the California State Teachers Pension Fund, CalSTRS. Um, and I asked him at one of the breaks or something why, why he was on the SASB board. Why, did, why do you care about sustainability accounting? I was asking myself the same question. I thought I might get an answer from him. And he said, we need to look long term at CalSTRS. We're talking about teachers. Most of my pensioners are women. They're teachers. And they're Californian. So they're sporty, and they're in good health. Right now, and then he looked at me for emphasis, I have more than 45 pensioners who are over the age of 100, and the cohort is just growing. And he said, and to me also, it's not just a check. It's not just money. I don't want to hand anyone who is a beneficiary of my pension fund their check over a scorched yard, dried up water system, and worsening civil strife. That's, that's not what I'm in this business to do. These are beneficiaries. We have to know that our companies we're investing in are on board 
for the long term, that they're going to be there and they're not going to be pushing out externalities to the rest of us to deal with in the long term. Expanding accounting topics to standardize reporting of material risk factors in public companies held by that fund, by CalSTRS and every other pension fund, and for that matter, almost everybody else, is system change. It is changing the plumbing. And finally, a quick note from the Heron Foundation that's really aligned with the CalSTRS example. When Heron's board and staff wrote its investment policy statement, including our view of fiduciary duty, we put beneficiary squarely in the center. Beneficiary risk isn't the risk of financial loss alone. We wrote, quote, for Heron, our definition of risk encompasses risks to the beneficiaries, including the risk that companies we invest in in our endowment cannot deliver results, reliable jobs, and related net positive contributions to society. Our view is that poor financial performance impairs an enterprise's ability to provide mission returns, and poor performance on broad social dimensions translates into impaired enterprise value and higher risk over time, including impairment of our financial return. We think about both and. It's not an either or world anymore. It's both and. Fiduciary duty, that whole world is part of the plumbing. We have to broaden it and have beneficiary risk front and center. That's what a fiduciary is. This is not new. This is what it is. Whether we're philanthropies, financial institutions, governments, or nonprofits, none of our obligations will be realized in this global world without system change inside our own houses. The good news is that we're not starting from zero in refitting the plumbing. The kind of works organizations such as B Corp, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the Circular Economy stuff, Southern Bank Corp, and other great CDFIs such as LIF, who's in the audience, the Federal Reserve, <laughs> the Federal Reserve Bank of New York even. And of course, the extraordinary work you're going to hear from, from each of our panelists, that's making it happen. The world today is not the 1889 or even the 1967 world of neat divisions. We don't live in the sequential order, orderly world we developed our plumbing for. The animating energy of philanthropy prescribes that this work is not a thing apart. It's not the one-third, one-third, one-third linear universe of Carnegie. It's integrated into the way we live our lives, invest our funds, engage with our neighbors, and protect future generations. Changing the plumbing is in each of you and our power to start. Just take the first step. And thank you. <laughs> thank you. Can I ask the panel to come on up? Um, so Claire, I don't think this is a term, but it was just popping in my head as you were speaking, which was accountant philosopher. <laughs> and uh, that was fantastic. That was really exciting. And then we're going to we're going to flesh out some of this uh, these concepts, both how that plumbing gets replumbed, re re I suppose. I don't want to mix, mix my metaphors there, but how it also gets received. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to hand the sort of microphone over uh, to my friend and Andrea Levere. I started us a little bit late, so I'm going to cut her, uh, her introduction a little bit short. But suffice it to say, Andrea is also an accountant philosopher. So I, you will not remember this, but I went to an affordable housing conference about 20 years ago. The first time I ever met you, I didn't meet you, but you were running an accounting class. And I went a day early to learn something. I didn't know anything about accounting. So the idea that that's how we met, and she is literally the smartest person I know, and so organized, it is like a dream every time I have a chance to have a meeting with Andrea, because she's got an agenda that she sends out to everybody, 
three days ahead of time, and she writes up all the notes afterwards and sends them out to everyone. So you, if you're ever planning anything, get her on the team, because it will be organized. Um, Andrea was form the moving force behind Prosperity Now, formerly a CFED, but really a uh, national, international leader on the ideas of how you build household financial well-being. We're super excited to have her here, and she'll introduce her panel next. Thank you, David. Is this working? Good. Um, so first, I want to thank David for hosting. And um, there really has been two decades of collaboration. And I think that nobody has been more focused on really advancing ideas in terms of increasing economic and social justice. But I do want to tell you what his byline is, which is simply, let's stop doing so many stupid things. <laughs> and I really like that because it sets the bar just where we need to start. <laughs> and then I just want to thank Clara again for bringing your really penetrating insights to expose the invisible architecture of our capital and philanthropic markets. And um, as I'll say, since I stepped down from Prosperity Now about two and a half years ago, I took on a uh, role as an executive fellow at the Yale School of Management where I went to business school, and I decided to focus on the issue that drove me crazy the entire time I was raising money for a nonprofit which was that most of our foundations, and that doesn't include any of the foundation people who are in this room who funded me, <laughs> all right, is that most of the foundations violated every rule of finance that I had learned in business school. And so I thought about, well, everybody and their mother is doing impact investing. So nobody needs anybody else looking at that issue. But I went back, because Clara and I had collaborated over the years, and looked back at her work on philanthropic equity which was really, when she talked about Oliver, the whole idea that nonprofits are enterprises just like for-profit businesses, except they have a harder job. They have to solve problems that the market can't solve. So they need the same kind of long-term, unrestricted, flexible capital, but also aligned with the financial expertise that you need to build a financial model that works, that helps you achieve economic sustainability. So with that, I was able to take the work she began and really create for these, this moment the blueprint for enterprise capital. I had to change the word from philanthropic equity because you know that equity now means 10,000 things. So everybody would just get endlessly confused. And with that is really looking at this moment to both change how we fund nonprofits, but also what we saw is that if I had spent 30 years of my career focused on the racial wealth divide at the household level, it's absolutely replicated within the nonprofit sector. And this is the kind of capital that can fill that gap. So with that, it is my extraordinary pleasure to bring the panel here today who can tell us or share the solutions for how we begin to change the plumbing, change the plumbing together to fit in the 21st century. We begin with Jeffrey Canada, who is the founder and leader of the Harlem Children's Zone and the William Julius Wilson Institute, and has become a passionate believer in this kind of capital. Um, Corey Anderson, who I've had the great privilege to work at, he is the chief innovation officer at the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation, which is not the Rockefeller Foundation you're thinking of. It's the other one in Arkansas. And what's so compelling is that this is a state where the work they do is infinitely important. And he's also a reverend, so he, also ha he always has the best quotes. <laughs> and um, Audrey Choi, who is now the senior advisor at Morgan Stanley, um, but has been an extraordinary innovator in this space within the corporate sector, but also, and she shares this with David, was the chief of staff for Janet Yellen, who is my passionate girlfriend for many, many years. And my husband just is, accepts that. Um, so with that, I want to open the panel and really begin by asking each of the panelists, along with Clara, who's going to be with us, how are you changing the capital markets for this moment? And Corey, will you start us off? Sure. Thank you. 
Andrea. Uh, and Thank you for the invitation uh, and to the Fed to, to invite uh, a little guy from Arkansas. Uh, I, got on the, I got on the airplane this morning and the stewardess said, she said, you're you are looking really spiffy this morning. I said, well, I'm going to the big city. Uh, I, gotta, I gotta at least look, look, look half the part because uh, you know with COVID and everything else, most days I'm in a, a polo and uh, khakis these days. So I, I am excited to come up here. Um, Chief Innovation Officer, uh, at the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation. And I tell this joke all the time, and this is the place where this joke has to land. I say that the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation is the Little Rockefeller Foundation because we're in Little Rock and we are smaller, exponentially smaller. Uh, we've got a, about $150 million in the bank and we do about $6 million a year in grant making. Like that's one program officer at the Rockefeller Foundation does that. But we had the benefit of Governor Winthrop Rockefeller, one of the brothers, making his life in Arkansas. Uh, he, he probably had houses everywhere, but he made his home there. Uh, ended up becoming governor. Uh, and as governor, he was the first, this is 1966, so he was the first governor, first Republican governor since Reconstruction, if history folks know what that means in the South. Uh, and, and everything, in terms of philanthropy that the family had meant up to that point he brought to Arkansas, uh, in addition to bringing black folks to Arkansas with him to run his businesses, right? In addition to, as governor, opening up state government to African Americans and other folks. Uh, so I literally helped to create a middle class. Our mission today is a relentless pursuit of equity for all Arkansans. And it's three types of equity, as you said, lots of definitions, economic equity, educational equity, social, ethnic, and racial equity for all our Kansans. And so, but for today's purpose about these capital markets, I wanna talk about economic equity because we define economic equity by saying we want every Arkansan to be able to live in a thriving community, earn a living wage, and build generational wealth, right? Uh, and that sounds like something Carnegie might have said, yeah, we want your community to be thriving, uh, we maybe we want to pay you enough to to buy stuff that you need, right? <laughs> uh, and, and maybe we want you to be able to put some money back to save. Um, and and that definition, right? When we talk about this idea of bringing together sort of the private capital markets and philanthropy, like you can't have thriving communities if if the private markets aren't investing in communities, right? You can't have living wages uh, if businesses aren't paying living wages, right? Which is a, a form of investing in their workers. Uh, and you certainly can't build wealth. Like how do you build wealth? You have a house, you own your own business, you own part of somebody else's business. Now there's lots of permeations of those three things, but that's really it. Like you own land that appreciates, you own a business that appreciates, you buy parts of somebody else's business that appreciates. So, so what we've been trying to do as we try to make that mission real in Arkansas is, is, is help the private market, so help, help our banks, help companies and the like, understand that there are things that you can do. You talked a lot about risk and like de-riskifying things that folks can do. Because we're such a small foundation, what we're always trying to do is build these case statements and make these case studies of what we can do with our $2 that then other folks can learn from. So let me give you one example. Uh, during the pandemic, um, uh, everybody knows PPP, EIDL, on and on and on, right? That first round of PPP money, when we looked at where it went in Arkansas, and I'm using a, just a little bit of hyperbole, but we, we looked at where it went. Black folks in the Delta didn't get any PPP money. Now, now why is that? They, they, it was on the website. Uh, anybody could apply for a PPP, EIDL loan, but why is that? It's the plumbing. So where did PPP loans, how did, they, how did PPP money get from the federal government to the business? It went through private banks, right? So there's this plumbing, right? And, and what private banks are serving black folks in the Delta? Well, Southern serving them, uh, Hope serving them, but the private banks weren't serving those folks. So the first round didn't get any money. The community, uh, they, we, we've got a board member who's a mayor in one of those communities. He came and said, hey, the barber, uh, the restaurant, uh, the, the detail shop, these businesses that are the, the, the fabric of our, of our little bitty communities, they didn't get any of this money. Like, how can you all help? And we said, well, 
we got a couple dollars, so we can, we can set aside some money so we can get some dollars directly to these businesses, but it's this plumbing piece, right? And so what we did was we created this, we, we put together a pot of money, and we funded community organizations in these communities to be economic first responders to these businesses. These were the, the little bitty organizations where they were calling anyway to ask about PPPs. We funded them, connected them to the CDFIs, and the idea was, was that the barber could go to his local community organization, uh, get all his paperwork in order, uh, be presented to the CDFI, so he could get a little bit of support. We gave him a little uh, $1,000 grant to the business, and then the CDFI could present them to the bank, right? So we're, again, we're, we're, we're messing with the plumbing of these systems that wasn't working for folks. That pushed us, though, to really think about, big, and, and, and again, we maybe could have just stopped with your remarks and just talked because you sort of talked all over the things that we're doing, right? General operating support. We, we, and we, we're, we're doing that now, multi-year grants. We're trying to ask these questions. But when the pandemic happened, we were pushed to ask ourselves, how could we go even further than just general operating support, right? Like what could we do next that really is, is not about just giving people more operating support, but asking this question, like what can we do to support your growth? We as a philanthropy, like we're not gonna make Arkansas a, a, a place where everybody lives in a thriving community, earns a living wage, and builds wealth. Like I have five million dollars a year. Like I, I, we can't do that as a foundation. It's these folks that are out there organizing communities. These folks are out there holding banks accountable. Those are the folks, the nonprofits, that are gonna be able to do it. So we pushed ourselves to ask this, this next level question. Uh, and as David said, Andrea was right there with an answer. Enterprise capital. What would it mean if, if the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation and other folks in Arkansas, again, we're a small state, we're only three million people, so we've got a small philanthropic community. But what would it mean if Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation uh, and the Arkansas Community Foundation and the Walton Family Foundation and the Wingate Foundation, and, and none of these folks have committed to anything. I'm just tossing their name out into the ether uh, and they'll hear me. But what would it mean if we created a $50 million enterprise capital fund where, where the nonprofits in Arkansas, as opposed to, and, and I know Jeff may talk about this, but you've already talked about it, but as opposed to submitting themselves to this sort of deficit uh, financing model that we all, one way or another, as, as opposed to committing them, submitting themselves to that, that we collectively, as philanthropy in the state, could just ask them, what could we do to support your growth, your scaling, more impact, more organizing, more support for, like, what could we do to support that? What would it take? Uh, it takes money, right? So more money, but what also? Like, how could we use our voice in different ways? Um, Ambassador James Joseph, uh, and I don't know that, yeah, I've heard him talk about, I heard him talk about Smurf, your social capital, your moral capital, your intellect, intellectual capital, reputational capital, and then financial capital, right? Like, how can we use all of those things in ways that simply support the growth and aren't about, oh, how can we give you as little money as possible to do as much as possible? So we, we pushed ourselves, and so now with Andrea's help and some other folks, we spent the literally the last eight months uh, going out and again, building these little case studies. Like what would it mean to Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families, who's our premier sort of state advocacy? What would it mean, uh, and they're gonna get a new ED shortly, what would it mean for that new ED to step into that organization and the first thing that he, she, or they have to do is not worry about raising money? Like what would it mean to the 2023 legislative session in Arkansas uh, where we, win the awards for ignorance. Um, what would it mean if a progressive policy organization had what they needed to be able to organize and advocate? So, yeah. hey Jeff, nobody has reinvented neighborhood developments plumbing more than you. How do you look at this question? Uh, so, first of all, I... Clara, that was so good. I, I just wanted to get up and yell and shout when you were speaking uh, because <laughs> Because, I mean, but I'm being serious, uh, because I, I've spent the first half of my career uh, convincing really smart philanthropists 
who really cared about poverty, that I could solve poverty for $50,000. Just I could do it and I could, I could be passionate about it and I could convince them and if I got them to cry, maybe they'd give me the 50 grand and, you know, and I'd go off and say, okay, who's next? Uh, it, the system made no sense. Uh, and this idea that uh, there are financial systems that make sense. There are financial systems that actually are designed so you're actually able to accomplish the mission. And the, the, in our business, it's the opposite of the law of big numbers. The bigger the number, the less likely you are to get any money. So the smaller the number with the most people attached to it, the more likely somebody thinks they should fund this. And it just drives all of us to the poorhouse, right? And it's why folks don't stay in this business. And the reason I got so, um, I think, excited about enterprise capital when, when you talked to me was there would not have been a Harlem Children's Zone uh, except for an accident. I had a friend who was, ran a foundation and I was interested in really solving poverty, intergenerational poverty, in a place, Central Harlem. And she had a place-based strategy. She said, Jeff, are you interested? I'm interested. We should do something together. Why don't you write me something? And I thought to myself, that sounds like a $400,000 grant. So I wrote it a $400,000 grant. She said, uh, really, really, Jeff, really? I said, no, give that back to me. I was like, wow, this might be the million dollar grant. So I wrote the million dollar grant and she says, okay, so you're gonna end poverty for this? I said, well, not really. <laughs> I wrote it a $10 million grant. I'm, this is a serious story. And she looked at it and she said, okay, for this $10 million, you're guaranteeing me, you're gonna, I said, guarantee? Gu no, 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 I'm not guaranteeing. So I wrote her the truth. I wrote her the truth about what it would take. It was $30 million, what it would take to really do this work. The, the cradle to career, the 97 blocks, the comprehensive support for children and families, the rebuilding the community. I gave it to her, she said, Jeff, this is, I said, no, now that's real. She said, you're gonna, I said, I will guarantee you. She said, I only have one question. I said, what, where are you gonna get the money? I said, I said, I thought you were going to give me the money. She said, I don't have that kind of money. But, but let me tell you what happened. I wrote the truth, and I didn't have someone from uh, J.P. Morgan saying, uh, tell me how uh, to invest in your growth. I had never heard a funder tell me that. I had never heard anyone say that we're prepared to back an idea that's big, because we understand you as a customer, that, that we have confidence in what you can do. Uh, so then I had to go out and raise the money. And you know what? No one, people liked me, they knew me, they thought I was, sir. that kind of money? People were like, you know, Jeff is, he's, good, he's a little crazy. I'm not giving him that kind of money. And I'll tell you how we ended up starting to raise the money. My board chair, Stan Druckenmiller, had worked for George Soros. So we brought the plan to George, who, makes big bets all the time. He gave us our first seven-figure gift. And then something happened in the rest of the philanthropy because they said, well, Jeff's crazy, but George is not. <laughs> so maybe we should take a second look at this thing, right? And I thought, what a crazy way to try and change uh, conditions in the most devastated places in this country. That makes no sense. There are too many different things have to happen. I kept, I'm just haunted by how many other people will not even tell the truth about what it takes to solve a problem because they know no one wants to hear that. No one wants to hear that number. They can't even conceive about how they would ever raise that much money. So you know what we did? We did the best we could do with the little bit of money that we got to help as many folks in as many ways as we could and we never thought we were solving the problem even though we had to go out and tell folks all the time we had solutions. We knew there wasn't a market to do that. So when I joined the board of Blue Meridian Partners, uh, Nancy Rube had this concept that we need to get really big bets together. We need to get folks who are prepared to put $100 million bets towards big problems because these are serious efforts and it takes serious money. And I just was all in on that concept. Uh, and even with doing that, 
the people that I am most concerned about are folks the closest to the problems. So the closer you get to the real problems, the folks who are working with the homeless, working with the drug addicted, working with the gangs, they have the most fragile infrastructures. They're the ones who are making all of these promises, uh, going out there working, so, and, and what do they have in the bank? They have nothing. And government, you know, in many cases in New York, you have to front New York City the money that they will then reimburse you, right? It's just, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, how are you gonna ask this not-for-profit to, to take out a loan? Who can get a loan when you have nothing uh, in your, on your balance sheets to fund the, so this whole system is designed, in my opinion, to take brilliant people and convince them within 10 or 12 years they should go into a different business, mm. right? That, that this, I mean, who wants to live like this for real uh, and have to deal with this in a system that just doesn't make sense uh, and you're constantly being called on a carpet to produce outcomes when no one has funded you and given you the resources to actually do that. And these are really smart and good people. So as soon as I heard from Andre, I signed me up. I am all in. Let's change this uh, because uh, I think we are uh, hurting our country uh, by not allowing uh, what we know works in business. I just kept thinking of folks and how many years was Tesla uh, unprofitable and they could raise all this money and everything because people believed, right? And it was just like, no one, no one doubts, right, that in the for-profit world, you fund a bunch of things that don't work, mm -hmm. right? And no one decides, well, that's a stupid thing. We're not doing that anymore, right? People, they don't think about our business like that, that this is worth investing and if you're investing in some things don't work, then you're probably doing the right thing. Uh, because once you make sure that everything is exactly the way it is right now, that means nothing's going to change. And I think that's where we've been in a lot of places. So I could go on. Clara got me started. So I'm going I'm to stop there. Though. Really, not enough passion here. I'm really worried, right? So Audrey, you were in the nonprofit sector, then you were at the highest levels of government, and then you said, let me go where the money is and see what I can do. So give us the perspective of how you see the plumbing and how that, with your incredible role, has evolved over time. Great. Well, thank you, Andrea. And, you know, I, I do have to say, though, I thought you liked me until you put me in the speaking roster after a prophet, a preacher, and a philosopher accountant. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> that was a very good line. <laughs> well, we got to compete now. Corey had sports on best line. So, um, so yeah. Look, I think this is in part this is the the panel of unexpected beginnings and where we end up. So, Clara was an art major. I was a comparative literature major, and uh, you know thought that I was going to be a philosophy of language esoteric professor. And my you know life stream was maybe I'll get tenure at a university somewhere near a major airport. Uh, and then, um, and then life intervened, right? And I ended up at the Wall Street Journal, not having ever taken economics, not having wanted to be a journalist, but because I was, I got very caught up in um, in German politics because uh, I was dating myself. I was in Germany the last year that East Germany existed as a separate country, and um, my, my best friend was a defector, and it was actually an experience in East Germany where I was on my way to register at the police that you know, this foreigner was here, that I started interacting with this four-year-old on the streetcar, who was this incredible, you know, the, the cherubic, like the, the, the curls, the cheeks, and he's smiling and he's playing peekaboo behind the most pathetic, shriveled brown apple that you've ever seen. And I knew that 30 kilometers away, there was kiwis and mangoes in November in Germany for no good reason, and here there was not. And I was like, this is why economics is a social justice issue and why I'll have to do my narratology philosophy when I'm in my 80s. Um, and, um, and so I went into, the one way I could get close to the action was the one thing I could do as a lit major was write. And that's why I became a Wall Street Journal correspondent. Um, over the seven years I was there, I had this amazing opportunity to see where economics and politics all landed for the union worker or for the head of the steel mill that was being privatized and whatnot. Um, and I loved it, but I felt like after seven years that I had spent seven years with courtside seats and I kept on being like, give me the ball, give me the ball. Like, and so, um, so that's when I said, coach put me in. 
And that's when I ended up in government and got the opportunity to work with Janet Yellen, uh, Al Gore, and all these other great, great um, public servants. And I really saw there the immense, um, immense power of government. Right, that you know, we, we can play like pro hockey all day long, but if the floor is tilt, the ice is tilted. I'm, I'm not a sports person, so I should never use sports <laughs> analogies, but I always do. Yeah. Right, but like government's what helps us level the playing field or tilt it, you know, so that the you know arc of history can bend toward justice. It can't do that without a playing field that at least is not against it. Right, so government was incredibly inspiring for me. But the part that was really un uh, really um, sobering and sort of illuminating about the government work was seeing how much um, if you, so to your plumbing and architecture point, if you build your house on a foundation of hopes and enjoyment of proximity to a rose garden ceremony, which is what we did most of our public-private partnerships on, and say, well, we don't have the budget for this because we don't want to run a deficit, so we're going to try to have a public-private partnership. And we'll get all these generous companies to come and stand next to the president and say, we support combating the digital divide, so we're going to donate free fiber, we're going to pull free fiber, we're going to da 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 You know, if the president leaves and the roses ain't blooming, suddenly those companies are like, why am I cutting a check? Right? And so, especially when I left government, and I saw, you know, because as we all know, elections have consequences, um, and voting matters. Uh, when you saw a change in the president, you saw a change in those priorities that were discretionary, that were new initiatives. And I really felt like, gosh, government is critical and, if you actually want to drive lasting, mm -hmm. truly sustainable change, what I also like to think about is a flywheel of change. Right, where you know, the more you change, the more speed you get, you gotta get business involved. Um, and it can't be business as large as, because we'd seen too much, it's all the, you know, in the 1990s, we got donations for everything, right? And then dot com bust, and suddenly, everyone's cutting funding to charities at the exact moment that nonprofits have more demand than ever. But the companies are saying, well, our earnings are bad, we just, we don't have that extra. So I ended up actually saying, can I, this is time for me to go sort of into the belly of the beast, into business to say, how do you kind of, you know, infiltrate and inspire from inside? And say, how can we find a way to turn your profit-seeking engine, your what I'll call good greed, into a vehicle for change? And so that's, I, I threw a whole bunch of happiness. I landed at Morgan Stanley, and I did in that, in, which was crazy in 2008, as my good colleague Roy will remember, uh, Roy Swan, who, uh, who was part of our Mary team eventually. Um, you know, in 2008, we were in the midst of the crisis, and I took this little PowerPoint deck up to the, the C-suite you know, level, and I said, you know, <laughs> we, we touch the world through the capital markets, right? We, as we breathe in and out, trillions of dollars are sloshing through it. And we have a philanthropy, and we have a corporate values around integrity and giving back and doing the right thing. But we we can't be just we can't be to your point. We can't do good with what's left over on the surplus pile. So how do we put, bake it into the business? And so that's when I you know, came up with this cockamamie proposal 15 years ago at Morgan Stanley to have this thing that we call the Global Sustainable Finance Group. And it was built on, this is not philanthropy, this is not marketing, I don't get a grant budget, but I get to gumshoe around the business and say, how do we harness the power of the capital markets to strengthen um, communities, to provide opportunity and to protect the, um, the environment? And I will tell you, as you all know from being you know, in, the, in the trenches, the first number of years were, um, Fun me, all right. The first couple of years I characterize as the uh, the charming era of my career, where I would come and I'd say, you know, business can be a force for good, and there's ways that we can do these things. We'll strengthen the economy, but also be. Pro and I would get the oh, that's lovely, dear. Um, but no, I'm not talking to my clients about that. My clients come in every quarter and they beat me up in return. So like, no. Oh, maybe the wives would want to be interested. So maybe the next time my client comes in, maybe you could talk to the wives and charm the wives, and that'd be lovely. Um, so I had a whole charming period, and then you know we kind of kept on building the data for why it actually was way more than charming. Fast forward a few years, they're like, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, and I have these like groovy, high-tech billionaire clients who want to do some sort of like mission-related thing or some you know, purpose-driven, I don't really know what they're talking about with their purpose-driven business plan, but they'd probably think you're cool, so can you come along? 
right? And so that was really what I kind of called the charismatic. So I suddenly went from charming to charismatic. I'm like, okay. So, you know, we did our thing. Meanwhile, we, meanwhile we're building actually products yeah. and investments. And as you know, we're actually getting money out there. Um, and the wives were more interested. And the wives, oh, by the way, were right. And the wives, oh, by the way, are set to inherit trillions and trillions of dollars, which will then pass to their millennial you know, children who are even more passionate about this. And then, and then, of course, it turned into the, you know, into the what I call the, the commercial phase. All right. So when we started this, it was less than 10% of the market of professionally managed assets wanted anything to do with sustainability. That was mostly faith-based organizations. Uh, you know, fast forward is now more than one out of three. And shockingly, now that it is more than a third of the market, now that it's more than 30 trillion dollars globally, more than you know, 15 trillion dollars, and it's suddenly we have so many people who have always thought this way. Um, and so, right, so I often say it really is true that success has many fathers, and it's wonderful. Um, but that's where I would say that, you know, for me now, it, it really is about how do we break, bake this into the infrastructure of capital markets. And I'll just end by saying is, but therefore, I think that what we, the moment that we're at now is, um, is a really interesting one because we, we have this enormous momentum sort of high velocity of everyone, as Clara would say, yodeling, that purpose has always been a part of everything they do and every dollar they deploy and every product they make. And now's the time we need to make sure that the impact doesn't get lost in it and that we really hold ourselves to rigor about why are we doing this and what are we actually driving with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Clara, any Reflections, comments on I this? I agree with everything that Audrey said. <laughs> no, it's, no. no it's, an, it's a wonderful array that brings home that this is a, a system problem. This is a social problem that has to do with the way we think about our world mm -hmm. and what's right and, and how it works. Um, and if we don't build in the, 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 the mission aspects or the you know, you know, the ESG, God forbid, this has now become, it's, it's turned the corner, Audrey. People are rebelling against it. Yeah, no. <laughs> I won't go into accounting, I promise. Anyway, um, then we won't be able to do all of the things that will bring everybody into the mainstream. That, that, that's what this is about. It's about making the mainstream uh, and the margins the same, <laughs> in the same room in the same house, mm -hmm. if nobody's left out. Beautiful alliteration. <laughs> so we are in a moment, right? And we don't want to lose this moment because there are many forecasts that the moment may be shorter than we had hoped for. And so I'd like each of you, as we think about this moment of increased federal funding, this moment of more philanthropic innovators than normal, and this moment of a significant investment in racial equity. Um, how do we think about leveraging that moment? Jeff, you want to start us off? Well, uh, I, I do think this is a moment, but I think that with the amount of money that we are uh, purposely uh, pointing at uh, problems in this country, uh, that we have to really make sure that we're building the infrastructure uh, because not-for-profits are businesses. Uh, and suddenly a, a business that's given large amounts of money and they've not built an infrastructure of how to manage it, how to account for it, how to make sure it's driving their outcomes, then folks are going to be like, well, that failed. That was a dumb idea. We should have never invested all that money right into uh, these uh, poverty areas. Uh, so I, I would hope that, and, and it's, I've been yelling about this issue, that we're really thinking about how you build uh, both the uh, sort of uh, intellectual policy side of, of business acumen and not-for-profits uh, as we're also ensuring that they have the kind of resources necessary. And, and I just don't think you can build one side of this and think that these, this money is going to pay off. And the thing that worries me, Andrea, is that time is now not our friend, right? I mean, we need to be doing this like right now because I've already, you know, starting, you know, there's a huge, I don't know, it's Wall Street, uh, the Journal or uh, Washington Post, they were talking about all of the money that went into unemployment, and it's like hundreds of billions of dollars is just fraud. And you know these ideas of fraud and waste are going to sort of drive uh, years of thinking about policy uh, if we can't 
uh, seize this moment and use it in a very productive way. The only, the only other thing I will say is that I also think this is a time to really push uh, us to not think about silos when it comes to these problems and how we solve these problems, right? I love your, your uh, analogy that the field is tilted. And when the field is tilted, a kid who's hungry is not going to do well. So is a kid who's exposed to lead. So is a kid who has asthma, is missing a whole bunch of time in school, right? You think about the sort of layers of challenges, and then you say, well, have the school solve that. Right? Well, the school can solve one piece of this thing, but it can't solve all of these things so that we're really talking about equity. And so I hope we're thinking about, in some places, uh, how we really uh, think about comprehensive uh, kinds of supports, because that's the only way, in my opinion, uh, with time, not going to happen overnight, uh, that you're really going to have an opportunity to solve some of these problems. taking on federal money to sure. help solve this. So right. would you share a little bit about how you're seizing this moment? A absolutely. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story before that gets us to the federal grant. Yep. So um, yes, the, the federal funding floodgates. There's a lot of alliteration here. <laughs> and you did good, Audrey. You've got some preacher in you, too. You, yeah. had, you had some alliteration. <laughs> You had three points, uh, so, so don't, don't, don't discount that. Federal funding floodgates have opened, right? Um, here's a good example. Uh, in Arkansas just last week, uh, the, the chief of the National Conservation Resource Service came to Arkansas, announced a $100 million investment in flood mitigation in 19 communities, uh, all of them led by African-American mayors. Um, I know you guys don't worry about flooding here in New York. <laughs> right, but we do, I know you do, we, we do in the Delta, right, so it's a big deal. Um, one of the black mayors said, he said, you know what, we wouldn't have got that money if we wouldn't have had an investment in technical assistance and capacity uh, that, that WRF and some other folks made in the Arkansas Black Mayors Association. And it's, it's a short thing. Basically, we just we paid some folks to help these mayors mm -hmm. respond to this federal opportunity because the, in January, the USDA says, hey, we got all this money and it's got to go to marginalized communities first, right? Like that's, that's a benefit of having a different administration is you've got people in D.C. that are saying, hey, we got all this money and it needs to get to the people that need it first, right? But the mayors, the Black Mayors Association, that's like your experience. That's the first time anybody has said that to them in 10 years. So they weren't ready. But what philanthropy was able to do is make this investment in putting some infrastructure in the middle to help them organize their applications, to help them gather all the data that they needed that they could not have done on their own. So we invested about $100,000 and got $100 million. That's, that's about- And what's that ROI? <laughs> Say again? What's that ROI? <laughs> right, there you go, <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's, well, <laughs> that we're, but, but we're, and, and we're convincing governance and other folks that this is the type of stuff that we're talking about, right? Um, so federal floodgates open. Uh, part of some other stuff, we had a, a health grant. This is COVID abatement, COVID, um, COVID, Abatement, I guess, is the right word. So, so going out, talking to folks about COVID, doing vaccines, $500,000 from uh, the Department of Health through our Department of Health. There was nobody in the Delta, again, because it's a reimbursement. Who, what, what organization in the Delta has $500,000 that they can expend to then, get, to, to then send receipts to the state, who then has to send receipts to the federal government, who then sends the money to the state, and then the state sends the money to the organization? So we stepped in, because we had a couple dollars, and we said, okay, we can front the first 100,000 and get this thing going. Um, and what that reminded us, right, again, this plumbing thing, that COVID, movement for Black Lives, that, that it revealed, what that reminded us is even with these federal funding floodgates open, the folks that need the money the most, the folks that are closest to the problem, 
aren't going to be prepared to take it. So the thing that philanthropy can do is invest, right? This is enterprise capital, right? Like right in the middle. What can we do as philanthropy to get this $100 million ROI? We invest $100,000 in a couple of people that know what they're doing. And three months later, here comes the Fed. It says, we got $100 million for these 20 communities. That's, that's, that's about jobs. That's about economics. That's about um, the environment, sustainability. That's about saving the delta of the United States so that all of us will have some place that can grow food you know, once the Central Valley is no longer there. <laughs> $100 million. So that, that's our thing, is, is how can we build infrastructure like now, today, so that we don't miss this opportunity? Uh, and we're building those case statements, right? Like, you got to add these pieces <laughs> to the plumbing if we're ever going to get this right in the long term. So we're making these investments, building infrastructure to put in between resources and small towns and schools and, and, um, and small nonprofits. But it's really, it's about today, making sure that you know, these floodgates shrink a little bit. We've gotten everything that we deserve, but it's also about building this case statement that there are these missing pieces to the system that philanthropy can, can, can make examples of, right? But then the system has to sort of pick up and say, oh, that's how, it's, that's how we need to do it anyway. Audrey, how do we leverage this moment? Well, um, look, I think that, to your point, one of the things that's been so extraordinary about the, the challenges that we've had over the last two years is I think that we've had a number of really significant light bulbs that have gone off, mm -hmm. and to leverage it, we need to keep those light bulbs on, mm -hmm. but we need to also not get them distracted. And so here's what I mean by that. In terms of the light bulbs that went on, I would say prior to the pandemic, um, especially when, I, when we talk about the dreaded ESG, the <laughs> environmental, social governances, you know, the additional things you should think about investing, for the past however many years up till the pandemic, people would often even say to me like, oh, Audrey, I'm an E investor, right? So I understand clean tech and climate change, but I don't know how S, and, you know, S particularly is related to it, but I'm an E investor. Someone else would say, oh, I'm all about women or I'm all about workers' rights, so I'm an S investor. And sort of nary the twain shall meet. And in the pandemic, I think was the beginning where so many people understood like, oh, they're actually related, right? And so I'll tell like you know, one, one bit of sort of storytelling data that for me was one of the ones that should should be the biggest aha if you know uh, if uh, if you need one right as so you think about our, our lovely um, community reinvestment act 1977 right where banks prior to that would redline areas and not provide them credit and so of course we had cra so of course everything has been solved um, now that we have uh, had those billions of dollars deployed if you today go back to the, um, the low-income neighborhoods that were historically redlined and denied credit more than 35 years ago. To this day, and you know something about climate, those neighborhoods are up to 20 degrees Fahrenheit hotter in the summer than rich neighborhoods in the same weather zone wow. because they have fewer sidewalks, they have fewer trees, they have fewer playgrounds, they have fewer water elements, they have lower quality infrastructure, and if it, particularly if it's a community of color, they are closer to sources of pollution um, more airborne, you know, pollutants, and, and which then therefore makes them more susceptible to respiratory disease. So surprise, surprise, as well as, of course, heat stroke and all these things. So surprise, surprise that you have during COVID communities of color having higher rates of infection and mortality in addition to the fact that, of course, because of the nature of their jobs, they weren't knowledge workers that could sit in their, you know, Cat5 wired home and telecommute. Um, and to me, that's like, that's the sort of this like vortex that shows you how much if you care about climate change, you are a social justice person. Mm -hmm. If you care about social justice, you must care about climate because as we know, the people most affected by climate change are, you know, are the low income, predominantly people of color in our country and around the world. So, and then of course, George Floyd, I think was this moment where you suddenly saw this unleashing of all these corporate yodeling to your perspective, Clara, of suddenly, you know, race, it was sort of like the, the, the I know, the breaking of the dam that we could be more explicit in having sort of racially defined philanthropy. Wonderful, um, right? Um, but I think there's two things. One is to capitalize on that momentum, one of the things we need to do is we need to help make people understand much more granularly and much more numerically why social justice can be good for the bottom line. 
I know that sounds terrible, but I think you know what I mean by that, right? And so just mm -hmm. as one example, we did this whole study around a whole bunch of things that co corporations can do in terms of what are their products, who do they target, what are their employment practices, and we developed this thing called the Inclusive Growth Index. So basically rate companies and say, how is your, your operations, your employment practices, everything about you, is it contributing towards inclusive growth or neutral or taking away from it? And, and we then ran the numbers of the performance of those companies. And what we found was really fascinating. The companies that scored high on sort of pro-inclusive growth, when they went to the capital markets, um, their debt was actually seen as less risky and like less volatile, so the credit spreads were tighter. And so it's not the same thing as like, because I'm a good employer, like my profits are, but it sort of, it showed that there was actually um, maybe one of the few instances of sort of the divine hand of the market, right? Mm -hmm. Even though they weren't going out and saying, here's a bond labeled as an inclusive growth, high performing company bond, if therefore it's less volatile, the market was sort of intuiting that, that they had sort of better good governance. So A, the little thing that we as bankers can do, right, is trying to make the data out there more explicit that says, yes, in addition to being environmentally sustainable and socially sustainable, these things actually do help your bottom line, whether it's in the capital markets or in retention and accretion and, of course, brand value. But the other thing I would say is, is again, I think, to your point, we just really, we, we have to be agile and fast and forceful about this because we're already seeing this moment dissipating, right? Between inflate, you, all you need to say is inflation and Ukraine and everybody's brain snaps kind of away from all this, right? And, um, and we were already seeing, even though you know, uh, sustainable funds outperformed in 2019, 2020, and 21, it only took one quarter with the volatile energy markets now, so that suddenly you're seeing for one quarter, after 36 months of underperformance, you're seeing one quarter of some of these, you know, uh, particularly sort of not sustainably focused funds doing pretty well and you've got the press, and you've got everyone sort of saying all ESG, sustainability, social justice, impact investing is hogwash, because look, these funds outperformed this quarter. Um, so I think that what we really need is we really need, to your point, um, that we really need more of a coalition between policymakers, nonprofit leaders, the you know sort of the incisive sharpness of philanthropy, um, and uh, you know, and business to say, could we please, for a change, not circle the wagons and shoot in? <laughs> But can we please say, like, let's, let's put this together quickly. Lara? So, you know, it's so interesting hearing Audrey talk about the business case. Um, and I know that uh, bond issue, bond raters, it, it's really, in a sense, the long-term case. Because bond raters always have taken into account, you know, does your government function decently? Do you have a decent water system that's going to be around in another 10 years? Well, why is that? Because the bond, the length of these investments is long. Mm -hmm. And so they're underwriting these bonds to see if this is going to happen long term. I would say one of the kind of, I think we have to get the principle of this idea that, that is a, is a um, Paul Hawkins idea, um, which is this idea of regeneration that instead of, you know, that we need to be putting, when we put a dollar into anything, whatever it is, it's about doing something that is going to be good for life, for human life, for whatever the planet mm -hmm. is bringing to us. Because in a sense, that is really our endowment. When we, in, we talk about perpetuity and we talk about returns and we talk about endowment, it's, it's nature. And if we focus our, you know, it, it, and it's not excluding environment because we're doing social. That is the either or as opposed to the both and approach. And I think we need to get focused in that way. And that will then start to return handsomely. But it's a long-term look. Mm -hmm. It'll close us out because I know this is just the first of many <laughs> events that David is going to be doing because we haven't solved all our problems today. Or we haven't identified all the stupid things that have to cease. Um, I would like each of you just to pick one structural, regulatory, or institutional change that you think, and you've already raised many, that you think can move us forward. Because I think what's very clear is the word integration. 
We need an integrated agenda that cuts across all the sectors that are here um, and uh, may not include Twitter. And um, just to start with that, so Clara, you want to start us off? Yeah, I think that business model integration, that is my favorite thing. Yeah. Uh, foundations tear down the wall between giving and investing. In banks, no, actually, CRA should be part of your core business. Why aren't you doing this anyway? Um, and generally speaking, um, uh, ESG, for want of a better term, integrated into the very guts of the business, not the side business with butterflies on the website. You know. <laughs> we usually have puppy dogs and rainbows. Yeah, but, I know. Know, butterflies <laughs> Audrey? Um, I would say it would be um, you know, similar to my sister here, Clara. <laughs> um, it, it lengthening the length of our lens and broadening the width of our lens, right? And so look, I mean, yes, corporate folks can say all the inspired, high-minded, aspirational, wonderful things they want to, but when at the end of the day they're getting like, you know, held to what are your 13-week you know, earnings, what's your 13, you know, your 12-month recommendations. It's just too hard structurally for every line manager, you know, from CEO on down the line to, to be thinking about the long term, thinking about seven generations, right? They're thinking about 13 weeks, right? And they know that Wall Street will kill them if they miss earnings per share estimates by a penny. And so we got to figure out a way to get out of this short termism. Um, and there's a whole bunch of, you know, regulatory and or other changes that might go with that. Um, the other thing is just, you know, what do we think of as, um, you know, as valid data, right? The fact that we, you know, I, you know as the accountant, <laughs> right, the fact that people believe that what's on the balance sheet that was codified by accountants however many hundreds of years ago as like the things that should be on the balance sheet, that we would regard that as like the be all end all of what actually gives you insight into the value of a firm, of, you know, of a firm. It's like saying that, you know, the x-ray machine is the only thing that should give you any indications of the health of the being. As technology evolves, why would you not also want to add in your MRIs and your sonograms and your gene scans and everything else? And for us, that is the social data, the environmental data, the governance data, the everything about this company that affects, do you want to work for them? <laughs> Do you want to buy from them? Do you want your kid to work for them, right? Like all of these things are part of brand value. And so we got to just say it's like, you know, the accountants need to like either get a much bigger piece of paper um, <laughs> or a globe to write things on. Corey. Uh, I think I'd, I'd maybe pick up and amplify something uh, Clara said and maybe put it together with something Jeff said. Uh, from, the, from the philanthropic side is creating this more expansive definition of what fiduciary responsibility means, to be inclusive of our partners, that it's not just about whether we're spending more on pencils than we should or whether we're making risky grants, that it really is about, are we actually asking our partners what do they need <laughs> to, to scale, to thrive, to grow, right? So that more expansive definition, uh, and then by virtue of that, uh, again, just just doing away with this concept of risk and philanthropy. Um, I don't even I don't know who said it, but y you either win or you learn. Like one of the two, right? Like either you make the investment and things go well, or you learn something new, you reinvest and you keep at it. I think I, I would guess that probably 50 percent of 50, 60, maybe 70 percent of people in here have more than one smartphone, right? Like everybody's got. I know everybody's got more than one. And the only reason we got more than one, we got one and more than one is because when whoever was thinking about this stuff, they said, oh, that's not quite it. Let me invest some more money. <laughs> they said, oh, that's not quite it. But here's what I learned. Let me invest some more money. That's not quite it. And they kept going and they kept going and they kept going. And now, you know, I'm going through withdrawal because mine's is sitting over there <laughs> and not in my pocket. <laughs> but you either win or you learn. So let's get rid of this idea about risk in, in philanthropic capital. Jeff, take yeah. us home. Well, you know, I, I would love there to be a uh, mandatory formula uh, for uh, calculating uh, the kind of uh, enterprise capital uh, based on the uh, sort of communities you were serving, the challenges in that community, 
uh, and the uh, sort of uh, service provider uh, endowments, right? So uh, that obviously wouldn't work mm. for some of the colleges and universities in some places, um, because part of what I, I recognize is that in the world we live in, we have to justify why we want your money. And so if we want to do some kind of things, if I want my kids to have arts, I have to tell my arts, you know, is working on a part of the brain that right, you, you go you go and you do a whole thing, right? And they want to play uh, basketball, we're talking gross motors, but I had all of these raps I used to have for folks, right? And chess taught you how to think, uh, you know, strategically and you know, and I could and you know, people would look at it. We had a, one, a really a championship chess team, and they saw all these little black boys and girls from Harlem. They said, "Oh, their lives must be so complicated. They have to go two steps forward and one to the right, and that's why they're so good." No, they were good because we hired Russian grandmasters to teach them. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm serious to teach them in the first grade, right? Because we wanted to see them beat up on all the private school kids, right? And that's just like a little thing, right? But, but to me, to me. The, the folks did not trust me that if you gave me money, I knew what to do for my kids, right? That I was more invested in saving those kids than you were as the funder, and all of your restrictions and all of the proving I had to do for you of why I was going to invest in this boy or girl uh, had to meet a criteria that uh, was arbitrary uh, and often had nothing to do with the reason any of us got into this business. And so if there was just a formula that allowed us to say, I don't have to explain why I want my kids to take rock climbing, or I want them to take martial arts, or I, I want them to uh, you know, take a trip uh, to France. I don't have to explain that to anybody uh, because uh, everybody else who has money does that with their kids, and I think that would help my kids. If I just had a pool of money like that, I think it would free up uh, a lot of the ability of us to actually uh, trust the folks who are in charge to make the right decisions for their kids. I think somehow people think we're going to all take that money and buy like, you know, Mercedes or something with that money. So you have to, you know, every dollar has to be like lined up. I, I've just not seen that. Uh, and this idea that you should stay on the verge of bankruptcy, right? And that uh, if you can get to the third quarter, you probably have run out of money and you're trying to, I mean, I just think that is a horrible, horrible way to design a business to think it's gonna have long-term impact. It's gonna keep employees, it's gonna attract the best and the brightest. So give me a formula that's mandatory. You have to be able to calculate that enterprise capital. I'll be a happy man. All right, an algorithm. <laughs> So I'll add one phrase that came from my friend Dan Nissenbaum, which is reverse engineering. Let us end the practice of reverse engineering, which is a funder saying, oh, you can have my money, which is really exactly what you're saying, if you do X, Y, and Z. And I'll just end with one story, which is when we were writing the blueprint, I was watching a video of Brian Stevenson. Now, if there is a nonprofit CEO with more power in the planet, it's Brian, right? And somebody asked him about philanthropy, and he goes, oh, my last funder just said, you have to change your business model, and then I'll give you money. But Brian said, forget the money. You can go somewhere else. And it's really, how do we end that as a core practice with the algorithm? So with that, I want to thank this extraordinary panel. <laughs> Also comes up, or should we? Yeah. Okay. All right. I left my glasses up there. <laughs> well, you all are fabulous. I have to tell you that uh, for those of you who have not spent any time with um, these five, Fab Five, uh, not only are they some of the brightest, most compassionate people, they're some of the nicest people you'll ever get to meet, as is David Erickson. Um, my name is Otho Kerr. I'm a member of the community development team. I want to say uh, thank you for being here today. Um, after this, these uh, closing remarks, we're going to have a reception uh, outside. As David said, what's wonderful about being here today, how lucky are we that we get to be in community with one another yet again. And uh, how lucky are we also that so many of us are involved 
in supporting others. And uh, so as you leave here today, hopefully you'll go out, commune with others, be in community, learn from others, and see how you might be able to support all of these folks and the community development team in supporting communities. The Fed's goal, known as the dual mandate, is maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. What's of particular interest to me and the work that's connected to uh, the activity of the community development team of the New York Fed is the maximum employment com component of the, of the mandate. As Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic said last summer, that requires the dismantling of barriers that prevent folks from fully participating in the economy or deprive them of the opportunity to contribute to output and growth. At the New York Fed, our mission is to make the economy stronger for all segments of society. Therefore, in the Community Development Group, we're working to drive capital towards solutions to barriers that prevent underserved communities from equitably participating in the U.S. economy. And that's what's important about the conversation we're having today. Philanthropy, impact investing, and the capital markets all have a role lifting up individuals, families, and communities so that each one of us, each one of us, can not only contribute to the economy, but can benefit more equitably in the fruits of the economy. But as Clara said, our infrastructure is broken. Philanthropic dollars, mainly from foundations, flow through late 19th century plumbing. Corporations are learning that they need to redefine long-term success and impact investing is still finding its footing, greatly informed by philanthropic and corporate models. There is no doubt that there is a moral imperative behind the work that we all do, closing or eliminating gaps and disparities between indiv individuals, families, and communities, getting rid of those gaps, especially for communities of color, but there is an evidence-based practical imperative as well. San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly said, Many groups fare less well than averages we hear about each day, but, but disparities for bl uh, black Americans, many of whom bear the cost of both historical and current discrimination, are especially sizable. She said, leaving these gaps unaddressed is clearly unfair, but it's also unproductive. It keeps millions of people on the sidelines or underutilized and sells the economy short. She says, no entrepreneur would stand for this, but why do we? In their research, our San Francisco Fed colleagues found that systemic disparities and inequitable opportunities by race, gender, socioeconomic status, and a myriad of other indicators results in a misallocation or a complete sidelining of talent that ultimately bridles economic growth. Analyzing the years from 1990 to 2019 and eliminating gaps in employment, hours, and education, giving racial and ethnic minorities the economic values of their white counterparts, the San Francisco Fed research has found that the U.S. economy would have had about $34 trillion in 2019 dollars more output during these three decades if gaps in labor market opportunities and returns hadn't existed. So whether you're the person who has the moral imagination to see the world as it should be or as it could be, or sees it purely in economic terms, you have every reason to join this group before you today and reimagine how philanthropy, impact investing in the capital markets in general, can better support historically underserved communities. Today, our esteemed group talked about how philanthropy could act as both a source of capital and a model for fundamental changes needed to address today's challenges. And what was especially productive was that while each one of our guests is 100% focused on positive impact, their, their respective perspectives were greatly informed by the vantage point from which each person pursues their impact. Private sector, not-for-profit profit sector, philanthropic. Thanks to them, I think there are three big takeaways. You heard about the balance sheet. The balance sheets of organizations and individuals need to receive more attention. Today, we heard the case for enterprise capital, what Clara also calls philanthropic capital. That concept that asks philanthropy and impact investors to step up and invest more in nonprofit organizations, investing beyond that which merely covers cash flow. This kind of investment builds financial strength and resilience by developing infrastructure and organizational capacity, which we've heard so much uh, being needed today. 
philanthropic capital allows organizations to make different decisions, decisions that focus on, on the long term, which was mentioned, effectively matching long term capital with long term needs. Andrea explains, the beautifully, explains this beautifully and thoroughly in her piece, The Blueprint, Blueprint for Enterprise Capital. The same concept applies to individuals and families as well. Corey and the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation understand that it's dated thinking to believe that we can help communities thrive if individuals and families are merely meeting their daily cash needs. We need to help them build wealth. Wealth plays an important role in an individual or family's ability to withstand financial shock or economic disruption and to support future transfer of wealth Research shows that wealth also allows individuals or families to chart a more constructive path forward as well. We learned that foundations, corporations, impact investors, and nonprofits need to reset their objectives. Point number two, why do foundations, for example, limit their distribution to the IRS minimum of 5%? As Clara said, we're facing existential events while foundations are focused on maintaining or increasing the size of their corpus rather than investing for impact. Jeff observed that we're, we're going to, 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 we need to fund some of the toughest questions, uh, problems in America, but we need to fund them. We need to fund them thoroughly. We need the right capital. And Audrey noted that corporations likewise need to rethink their objectives. She shared that there has been a pronounced evolution over the past decade in how capital market investors and clients regard sustainability and ESG. Increasingly, they are understanding that the S is as important as the E. And that pace needs to be accelerated. And finally, we need incentives to be aligned with objectives. Should asset managers and CIOs continue to be compensated solely on return, or can social and environmental impact be a part of how they define success? Can we create disclosure documents that require organizations to pay heed to financials, impact, and inclusiveness? As Audrey noted, if we could see how inclusive a company is, how, an or, how inclusive an or organization or a company is, that might actually lead to different outcomes. It was discussed already, we need time to deep diaper and de de dive deeper and explore, de dive deep diaper, <laughs> to, to dive, dive deeper, dive deeper and explore other ways to move capital towards impact, capital towards change. We don't have that time, we will convene more, but I wanna thank I want to thank Andrea and Audrey and Clara and Corey and Jeff, David, Edison, Kelly, the entire community, community development team for being invested in improving people's lives. But I also want to thank you, the audience. Your being here today is testimony that you're invested in improving the lives of others as well. So let's leave here today. Let's do something about it. Let's bring about some change. As the father of a friend of mine says, doing it does it. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you.